do not even notice anymore. Sometimes we don't even realize that we're dealing with this. Divorce is a commonplace occurrence, especially in the United States. Everybody knows the shocking statistics, and no one's really that shocked by them at all. But the real statistics behind the statistics, the real fault and no-fault divorce, the things that fall apart and break apart under a policy of no-fault divorce, which we've had for some time in our country, are shocking. We're going to talk a little bit about them here in the first half of Issues Etc. Second Hour. Jennifer Roback Morris will be our guest. I'm Todd Wilkin, and thanks for tuning us in. We are coming to you live this Thursday, the 31st of July. You can join us with questions or comments on no-fault divorce, one eight seven seven six two three my ie 877-623-MIIE, or email us right here in the studio, talkback at issuesetc.org. In the second half of this hour, Dr. Thomas Madden of St. Louis University, an author of several books, including The New Concise History of the Crusades, will correct some of the misinformation that is so common out there about this period in the Christian and Islamic history, the Crusades. one eight seven seven six two three my ie talkback at issuesetc. Dot O-R-G. Jennifer Roback Morse is a regular guest. She's founder and president of the Ruth Institute based in San Diego. She spent 15 years teaching economics at Yale University and George Washington University. And she's author of the books Smart Sex and Love and Economics. Jennifer, welcome back. Thanks for having me, Todd. The claim is often made, or at least the assumption is made, that no-fault divorce was a step forward for individual liberty in the United States. It, has this proven to be true? Well, you know, in the short term, it looks like it's true because you get to do what you want, or at least one party to the divorce gets to do what they want. Um, but it, in the long run, it turns out not to be the case because in most divorces, there is, a, there is one reluctant party. That is, there's one person who doesn't want the divorce. And so the, the agents of the state have to step in and separate that person from the marriage, and particularly from the assets of the marriage, which usually mean the family home and the children. And so it, it turns out that the state gets involved then in all of the minutia of family life as they try to regulate custody and property disputes and all of the other things that come about when two people are not working together in this very private and personal area of their life. The state steps in to regulate those disputes and to deal with those disputes. And so a, a divorced family can have agents of the state literally looking over their shoulder and have every aspect of their life come under the scrutiny of the family courts, which is not my idea of personal liberty. I don't know about you, Todd, but I don't think of that as personal liberty. But let's set it in its context then, legally, or at least in terms of marriage as an institution and divorce as an institution, because they're both institutions. That's right. Um, before no-fault divorce, without a comprehensive kind of legal um, blueprint, what was the mindset toward marriage and its counterpart divorce before we had no-fault divorce? Well, well, first of all, the the presumption was that once you got married, you were going to stay married. Um, You might not be happy in your marriage, but you would stay married. Um, And and that was the the default presumption on everybody's mind and and in the law's mind. Now, you could get divorced, but you could get divorced for cause, and that was really the difference, you know, and that's what it means to say there's no-fault divorce versus some kind of fault-based system. Under a fault-based system, there's some kinds of things that are uh, legitimate grounds for divorce, and there's a defaulting party and and an innocent party, and the law would in some ways take account of the fact that one party had kept their vows and the other party had not kept their vows. Um, And and so it was, was in a sense, more like a contract where people default on contracts all the time, but the law at least takes um, some recognition of the fact that one party did what they said they would do and the other party didn't and has some arrangements for paying some kind of damages to the injured party. Under no fault, there's, there's division of property um, and some kind of allocation of, of child custody, but there really isn't any um, acknowledgement that one party may have done something to damage the relationship, that one person may have done something that, um, that caused the relationship to break down, in fact, that they didn't keep their part of the bargain. Um, in most states, the courts don't even want to hear about that. They don't even want to discuss marital fault. They don't want you coming in there and saying, oh, he did this and he did that, and therefore I'm entitled to more or whatever. Um, now, in point of fact, it turns out 
that the there's still lots of acrimony, there's still lots of disputing, there's still lots of fighting. It just goes on at the custody stage and at the property settlement stage. And they're, but, but they're not allowed to say, um, he, he was cheating on me. That's not supposed to be relevant. Or she walked out on me. Those things aren't supposed to be relevant to the, to, to the settlement. But all the animosity, all the disputing, it's all still there. It's just been transferred to a different arena than it used to take place, uh, than used to take place in the 1950s. Okay, so for bef before no-fault divorce became the, the coin of the realm, marriage was viewed, at least legally, more as a contract that if it, you couldn't simply dissolve it or say, okay, shake hands and walk away. It was something that, was, that the state thought it had an interest in maintaining, and, and those who wanted to divorce had to, in some form or in another, demonstrate that the contract had been broken substantially. Yeah, yes, and, and you see, one of the arguments in favor of getting rid of the fault base is that there were couples who both wanted, where both parties wanted a divorce, and they would have to go through the charade of accusing the husband of infidelity in order to get the divorce. But they both agreed, they both collaborated, they had their, they had the outcome worked out between the two of them before they ever started the whole thing. And so people said, well, gosh, this is kind of stupid. Why are we making them go through all this? Why not just have you know, a nice, simple, easy procedure so that people like that can get divorced at lower cost without all the charade? And you'd think to yourself, well, yeah, that makes sense. Why make them go through all that? But what people didn't anticipate is that by changing the rules in the way that we changed the rules, you brought on a whole bunch more people getting divorced who would not have ever thought about getting divorced under the old rules. And so there were there had been a whole slew of unanticipated consequences uh, because people just thought about that one case that was in front of their face right at the moment and didn't think about how they were changing the incentives and how that was going to play out. Um, you know, as as more and more people started using the system and seeing what the system was like and seeing how it worked, um, they really didn't fully anticipate the way the system would, the way the marriage system, marriage is a permanent vow, uh, how quickly that would all unravel. Did uh, the adoption of no-fault divorce, in some sense, redefine marriage itself? Yes, that's a, that's a good way to put it. it. It did redefine marriage. In a sense, it made marriage as a permanent, lifelong union. Um, it basically wiped that out. You know, as a legal as a legal fact, that it, that that doesn't exist anymore. Um, there are, there are people who, as a matter of religious faith, believe that and hold that, but um, but they don't have any particular standing in the law. You know, in other words. You go to the court and you say, well, you know, we got married in the Catholic Church, and according to the Catholic Church, he's still married. Um, enforce that version of the contract. They're, not, they're going to throw you out. They're not going to listen to that. So the people who are staying married, who get married and stay married for a lifetime, um, they really are, in a way, countercultural radicals, you know, because they really are bucking the trend of what the legal system and the culture has created around them. You mentioned before that uh, many of the people who divorce, even under the no-fault system, um, it's not always someone instigates the divorce in in some way against the will of the other spouse. Yes, talk about that a little bit. Well, I, see, I guess that was the big unanticipated thing. People had the idea that they were dealing with these divorces where both parties agreed, and so they figured, well, that's what's going to happen. People are going to agree to get a divorce, and it'll all be fine. But they didn't anticipate that um, one party could just say, you know what, I'm out of here, and the other party really doesn't have any way to say, no, wait a second, let's slow this whole thing down. They don't have any legal way of doing that um, anymore. And so, so that, that has been a huge change. And so by some estimates, you know, probably, probably two-thirds to three-quarters of divorces um, are against the will of one party or the other. It's really quite astonishing. Um, it, it's hard to get good statistics because there are certain things we don't ask routinely. You know, so you don't have, like, census data that tells that you know where everybody who's ever been divorced has answered the same batch of questions but some data sets do allow you to to either infer or to know directly you know whose idea was this anyhow you know and you can tell from those uh, from those surveys um, that uh, that there's in a vast majority of cases one party does not want the divorce um, and is going at it and it's happening against their will when we come back from this break we'll continue our course hey that rhymes those things happen. 
For the next 10 minutes of Issues Etc., I'm Todd Wilkin. You can join us with questions or comments, one eight seven seven six two three my ie Talk back at issuesetc.org. It's Thursday, July the 31st, in about five or six minutes. Dr. Thomas Madden on the Crusades. Paul is listening in Fort Wayne, Indiana. Paul, thanks for waiting on the line. Hey, great to have you guys back, and uh, great topic, Todd. Thanks for covering this. Thank you. Um, I, uh, a couple comments and then a question for uh, Ms. Morris. Um, I, I did think it's interesting, the, the historical note, that it was actually Governor Ronald Reagan who signed uh, the big no-fault divorce uh, bill into law when he was uh, governor in California in 1969, since he became kind of a big conservative hero later. He really kind of pulled the, the cork on this. Um, another uh, comment I wanted to make was a, a book that I found helpful on this topic uh, called Generation X, Adult Children of Divorce and the Healing of Our Pain by Jen Abbas. So I've recommended that to friends who have found it uh, pretty good. And then my question uh, for your guest is, I, I wonder if in her uh, research on this topic she's found that if the churches went through a theological change on divorce first, uh, especially on the issue of uh, what's called today malicious desertion, uh, sort of the idea that if uh, the, the husband has abandoned the wife or the wife has abandoned the husband, that justifies the, the divorce because that has been interpreted now to even uh, uh, allow for sort of emotional abandonment as justification. Thank and I'll, uh, I'll, I'll listen to the answer offline. Thank you. All right, Paul, thank you very much. Uh, what about his question there, Jennifer? Well, two, two points about it. First of all, um, abandon, abandonment or desertion in many states always counted as grounds for divorce. So, um, you know, marriage is supposed to be a sharing of a common life um, in most theological traditions. And so if the guy just disappears or the woman just disappears, after a certain period of time, um, many states had a provision to say, well, for all practical purposes, you're, you're divorced by default kind of a thing. So that, that often was part of the situation. But, uh, but expanding it to, you know, kind of emotional desertion like this, that, that's really something quite different, I think. I mean, they're using the same words, but the words mean something so different that I, I think you can safely say it's something different. Um, now, as far as the church's position, that's kind of that's a little bit harder for me to answer because um, I'm part of the Roman Catholic tradition, which at least on paper has always held the, uh, a rather strict line on the subject, as as most people know. Um, you know, we we take seriously the the statement that you're not supposed to get divorced and remarriage. The, the the prohibition, in fact is not on divorce itself. The prohibition is on remarriage after divorce. And the Catholic Church, um, you know, officially still holds that position and never changed that position, although their their practice in the 70s and 80s of, of giving uh, annulments rather easily um, amounted to a kind of change in policy, but at least in the, in the on, uh, on paper, um, they never changed their doctrine. Now, I can't speak for the whole of the uh, Reformed or Protestant um, theological tradition because obviously a lot of those groups did different things with it. But I think it's safe to say that um, our, our Protestant brethren, many of them, have um, gotten quite lax on the subject, both theologically and practically, uh, to, the, to the extent that um, churches, in effect, compete with one another to see who can have the easiest standards. Um, you know, that is, that if your church decides that, by golly, we're going to enforce Matthew 19 and we're not going to uh, allow you to remarry because you've been divorced, um, you can just go down the street to another church where the pastor is more obliging. And um, that has created some... Uh, some bad feeling between Catholics and other groups because uh, that you know sometimes people will will laughingly say to us, "Gosh, don't change your policy, okay?" Because half their congregation is lapsed Catholics who have divorce problems. Um, so that that com that competitive um, process that that has been set into motion by some of the churches relaxing their their uh, doctrinal and practical views on the subject um, that has been a problem, and I think that. More recently, um, in the in the 90s, and certainly since the turn of the millennium, many churches are starting to retrace their steps on that and take the whole question of marriage and divorce much more seriously than they had been, um, requiring premarital counseling, holding the line a little bit more on you know whether what what counts as a valid marriage, what counts as a valid divorce, and and so on and so forth. And churches are all over the map on that, but many places, uh, people are recognizing that the churches have to cooperate amongst themselves so that they don't get into this 
kind of competitive race for the bottom uh, that had been going on um, in, in the 90s. With only 30 seconds, has no-fault divorce proven to be good for men, women, and children? It's been a disaster for children. Um, it's been uh, difficult for women. It's been difficult for some women. Um, for the women who initiate divorces, it's not necessarily so bad for them. Um, but it, surprisingly, there are many men who have suffered a lot from divorce uh, because they are uh, they, their their spouses walk out on them, and in many places, the courts favor um, the wi the wife's right to to custody and so on. So there are a lot of dads who end up being cut out of their children's lives by the family court. Um, in, in ways that they would not have chosen uh, voluntarily, that's for sure. So um, it's, it's been a mixed bag for the, for the adults as far as the genders are concerned, but, um, but it's been a disaster for children. And you can also say uh, that married couples um, overall have better lives than those who are divorced. So uh, whether you're talking about men or women, um, marriage still conveys tremendous benefits to people uh, in comparison with divorce. Jennifer Roback Morse is founder and president of the Ruth Institute based in San Diego. She spent 15 years teaching economics at Yale University and George Mason University. She's author of the book Smart Sex and Love and Economics. You'll find a direct link to her website on ours, issuesetc.org. Click on demand and you'll find information on Jennifer Roback Morse and the Ruth Institute. Jennifer, thanks for being our guest. Thank you.